we thankful for this praise team? Awesome. There are some prayer needs we need to talk about, bring to your attention. Um, Terry Ray has been battling COVID this week, and uh, we, so we need to pray for Terry and his wife Nancy as she cares for him. We need to offer continued prayers for Trinity Payton, who's uh, been suffering an illness, and uh, just pray that she gets well and feeling better. Sonny Hauser fell this week, and I understand she broke her arm, so uh, she probably is in a lot of pain and discomfort and all of that. So we offer our prayers as she recovers from her accident. Uh, Jerry Schick had a, an episode this week with a, an illness. Uh, he was here this morning, uh, looked pretty good, but I'm sure he still would appreciate our prayers for his complete healing. And the youth today will be visiting the corn maze. So the request is for safe travels and a safe day for the, for the youth. Uh, we add to our prayers situation in Haiti that we understand um, there was a, a dreadful situation in the news this morning. People were kidnapped, and um, it, it just speaks to us because Joetta will be speaking about her missionary time in Haiti very shortly. And we learned during first service this morning that Jackie Ekes passed away this morning. So some of you know Jackie, so keep the, her family and the kingdom family in your prayers. So join me as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to be here today. We pray that we'll never take for granted the fact that we can be here, we can worship you, we can praise you freely without any fear of uh, anyone taking that privilege away from us. So we thank you, give you the praise and the glory Lord, there are so many needs among us. There are people who are ill, people who are in deep sorrow, uh, worried about their loved ones, people who are grieving, just so many situations and so many that we haven't mentioned because they're um, more private perhaps or people don't, just don't want them to be mentioned. But we all have pain in our hearts for family members and situations that we're not all aware of. So. We lift these to you along with each of the individuals whose names we already mentioned. Lord, we thank you for this day that is labeled Laity Sunday uh, for each of us who are willing to share our gifts and our talents. And uh, we hope that all of us will hear your word today to open our hearts, our minds, that your spirit may speak to us and uh, maybe open up some possibilities that we haven't been aware of before today. So, Lord, we ask you just to, to bless these situations as we come together praying the prayer that Jesus himself taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive them that trespass or sin against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power the glory forever amen Jenny Ryle is going to bless us this morning with a song, Is There Anything I Can Do For You? And as she's singing, please listen to the words of the song as a way of ministering to your heart and asking what it is that you can do for God. Thank you, Jenny, for singing this. Right. 
Thank you, Jenny, for doing what God gave you the ability to do today and minister to our hearts in song. This morning, I would like to share with you some of the experiences that I had in Haiti and try to help you understand a little more what it's like to be a missionary in Haiti. But before we begin, would you please take out your authorized missionary manuals and turn to Matthew chapter 28, verses 28, verses 18 to 20. It's the last three verses in the book of Matthew. I hear pages turning. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. God is a missionary God. The Father sends his Son, the Son sends the Spirit, and the Spirit sends the church. The church is a missionary institution. The Bible is a missionary book. It has stories of missionaries like Jonah and Abraham and Paul, to name a few. And the gospel is a missionary message. God never told the world to go to the church. He told the church to go to the world. The Lord expects us to be involved in bringing the lost souls to him. The Great Commission must be done. Some things never get done, but the Great Commission must be done. God has a plan for the nations, and you and I have a place in it. Coca-Cola seems to be everywhere. Even in Haiti, they have Coca-Cola. How did it get there? I recently read Coca-Cola's vision. 
They said, a can of Coke in the hand of every person on the planet. Why can't we give every person a Bible? Some people don't even have the Bible translated into their language yet. But we must remember that people are dying every minute, every second, and some of them have never yet heard the gospel. What are we doing to help reach the 3.2 billion people that have never heard about Jesus? I read this week that 163,898 people die every day. That's about two people every second. And that 40% of humanity is still in the dark with no chance of hearing the name of Jesus. There are a lot of tragedies on earth these days, but the greatest tragedy on earth is not having the opportunity to hear the good news of the gospel. That is the greatest tragedy on earth. I want to share a few experiences of my time in Haiti. You heard the announcement about the kidnapping in Haiti. This year, um, Haiti has been listed as the trophy of having the highest kidnapping rate in the world. That breaks my heart. They need our prayers. And last year in 2020, Haiti was listed as the fourth hungriest country in the world. My children's worker came to me one day and she said, even a strong Christian can be tempted to steal when they're hungry. We don't know what it's like to be that hungry. A pastor came and shared his encounter with a young widow who had nine children. She went to the local store and borrowed three cups of rice that cost about 31 cents US. The man who lent her the rice was ready to come and burn down her house because she hadn't yet paid for it. A pastor came at the right time that he, she needed to have the bill paid and the pastor paid her debt. You see, Haiti is in an intense spiritual battle. Pastor Raymond shared his experience. He was walking through his community and he saw a young man sitting along the side of the street, sobbing, sobbing. So he stopped to talk to the man. The man's wife and mother both died in the same week. He had to sell everything he had to cover the expenses. And now he was destitute. After this, the man decided he would go to the witch doctor and get a fetish or a voodoo charm so he could get some money. The witch doctor told him to return at noon on Tuesday to get the fetish charm. When Tuesday arrived, the man was in tears because the witch doctor wanted him to give his three-and-a-half-year-old son for the price of this charm. And he couldn't bring himself to do that. The pastor that God just put there at this time invited this man to a service at the church. So the man went, and he accepted Christ that day. <clears throat> Today he's busy and active, involved in the church with his son. I always wanted to be a missionary. Pastor Darrell spoke about that. But I could never see how God could use me. I can't remember not wanting to be a missionary. I'm sort of a Jill of all trades and master of none. I don't excel at anything. For years I struggled with this and then finally I said, okay God, we're gonna settle this. And I did a very scriptural thing that Judges chapter six where Gideon put out a fleece. 
I sat down and carefully, carefully planned out my fleece, something that God could never do. Don't do that, okay? <clears throat> because God answered it perfectly. Now I was committed to apply as a missionary. And I went to work, and I was still wanting some confirmation. And as I was working that day, this Bible verse popped into my mind. This is the way, walk in it. From Isaiah chapter 30. Okay, I got the point. Filled out the application. I told one person, one person, what I was doing so that she could hold me accountable to actually fill out the application and put it in the Franklin Post Office. I didn't tell my family, I didn't tell my pastor because I knew this was not going to work out and when I got all the doors closed, I would continue my life working at Quaker State Corporation. However, <clears throat> in September of 95, I found myself off to Haiti in this DC-3 plane which is older than me. And as I entered the Cape Haitian airport <clears throat> that first day on the field, a fellow missionary greeted me at the airport, and she told me that she was flying out on this plane to Florida for a week of dental care. Fine. Well, then she said, and you are going to teach my kindergarten class at Calvin International School this week while I'm gone. <clears throat> That was my welcome to missionary life in Haiti. And I soon learned that missionaries wear many hats. I learned to do a lot of things in Haiti. Where my friend Mary Lou and I lived at the duplex, we were a half a mile from everybody else. So every morning, one of us had to go out and turn on the generator. And at night, one of us had to go turn the generator off. <clears throat> that would be at 9 o'clock. I really enjoyed learning to operate the bobcat. <laughs> Guys, you got some neat things. <clears throat> and I only accidentally took out a few, just a few cement blocks at the clinic. <laughs> Another thing I learned to do on the mission field was hot wire cars. <laughs> I'm serious. <clears throat> Some days in the life of a missionary, you never know what the day is going to bring. One Sunday after church, we decided to visit one of the ladies from the congregation who had been very ill. When we walked into the small Haitian home, and there was a straw mat lying on the floor, and she was lying on the mat. We visited briefly, and, and then it kind of looked like maybe she had passed away while we were there. So wanting to confirm this, we asked the family if anyone had a mirror, and they brought a broken piece of a mirror in, and we did the doctoral thing of holding it up to her nose <coughs> and confirmed that she had indeed passed. <coughs> so um, we offered to help the family in any way that we could. So a few minutes, they talked, and then they came back and asked us if we would take them to the morgue with this body. We went to town, and upon arriving at the morgue, we were instructed to stay in the car because our white faces were going to increase the price of the morgue. It was fine to meet with me to stay in the car, too. <clears throat> So we waited, and they returned saying that, that that morgue was way too expensive. So would you mind taking us back out past where we were and going on to the next town up the mountains there? So we did that, and we got them to that town where they had a morgue. And same instructions, wait in the car. So while they were inside pricing the morgue, I'd never done this before. I was starting to wonder <clears throat> how the body was doing in the back of my SUV. <clears throat> it's been a while now since we've been driving around. <clears throat> I was relieved when they came out and said, yes, this morgue will work fine. 
So they took the body that was wrapped in the sheet and then wrapped the body in a blanket that was in my car, and after that, we could go home. I never dreamed my car, which is a Isuzu Rodeo, an SUV, I never dreamed it would be used for a hearse. And then uh, there were times when people would ask if I would transport the casket from the funeral to the cemetery. It didn't seem to matter if the casket fit inside the car or not. <clears throat> My original ministry in Haiti was to work with the children in the OMS churches. At that time, half the population of Haiti was under the age of 15. So in the summer months, the hottest time of the year, I would go each week to a different church and do five days of vacation Bible school. And we would have anywhere from 25 to 500 children in the churches. I didn't count any higher than 500. There's not really any point. <clears throat> if a child accepts Jesus at a young age, that child has the rest of his or her life to live for Jesus. And I strongly believe in that. There were three things that I learned by <clears throat> experience that you should not do in children's ministry. First, <clears throat> day one, do not use food items for the craft. <laughs> Who knew they would soon be eating the shoestring licorice? Two, while Burger King has these really nice gold crowns for the children to wear, I thought, oh, that'll be cool. I made some really nice paper hats with a crown, like a crown. But my homemade paper crowns were no match for those sweaty foreheads in the tropical heat. <clears throat> they didn't even last the first day. Number three, probably the most important, is never, ever lose control of the children. Do you ever lose control of your kids? Try that with a couple hundred children. I looked at my children's work and I said, what do I do? And she said, start singing. Well, I can do that. So we started singing and here that's what brings them back together. So don't lose control because it's not a pretty sight. Each day of vacation Bible school, we would give them a piece of paper that had a picture of the Bible lesson and the Bible verse printed in Creole at the bottom. The children loved the color. Many of them had never held a crayon in their hands before, so we would help them to hold the crayon. And, and Jesus was red, green, purple, all different colors. And at the end of the week, we would give each child a a simple peanut butter and jelly sandwich and a glass of super sweet Kool-Aid. These kids grew up on raw sugar cane. Pre-sweet and Kool-Aid does not cut it for them. You add a couple pounds of sugar <clears throat> and it's good. <clears throat> I'm not kidding you, I'd put five pounds in a cooler this big. <clears throat> I tried to make VBS for the children but sometimes the kids would come with baby brother or sister because mom had to go to the market that day. Sometimes teenagers would also come. Over the years of doing vacation Bible school, when I looked back through the records that I had kept each day, there were over 10,000 children in attendance. And over 1,000 of those children accepted Christ as their savior. If that doesn't warm your heart, somebody get the doctor. It was, <laughs> it was the week of the annual observance of voodoo religion in Haiti. <clears throat> and on Thursday of that week, doing vacation Bible school at this church where you're looking at, we were threatened by a menacing man. He warned the children not to come back the next day. And then he came to us, me being the one with the white face, 
and said not to come back the next day or there's going to be trouble. Okay. Friday was the day we gave the invitation to the children. We had to go on Friday. I'll be honest, when I drove my SUV to that church on Friday, I had knots in my stomach, wondering what was going to happen. On the table in the vestibule, there are these pieces of paper that say, in the face of evil. A friend was visiting me, and she went home that day and wrote this story. I encourage you to pick up one of these and find out what happened that day. You'll be blessed. It was a tiny, small structure with partial walls and a tin roof, a rural church in Haiti built in the middle of a banana field. When I did VBS there early in my children's ministry, we had about 137 kids, and on Friday, 37 children accepted Christ. Missionaries don't always see the fruits of their labors at the end of the day or even at the end of the term. Some we won't see till I get to heaven. But God allowed me to see one fruit from my labors. And it happened when I was teaching at our seminary. I was teaching a course on how to do vacation Bible school to a group of pastors. On the first break, one of those students came out and asked if he could talk to me. I thought, oh, I must have said something wrong already. <clears throat> then he proceeded to say that I probably don't remember him, but he was one of the kids that accepted Christ at Vacation Bible School some 10 years before the church that we just saw in the banana field. So my next thought was, oh no, was he one of those boys I yelled at that week? <laughs> was he the trouble? No. What kind of an impression did I make? And here he is now as a student in seminary to become a pastor. <clears throat> you see, I have a, a jailhouse voice I'm always behind a few bars and, and looking for the right key. <clears throat> now, it's really hard for me to teach these students a new song when I can't carry the tune, because they're not going to get it. And Silvio, the student that accepted Christ, he remembered all those songs, so he taught them for me. That worked out. Silvio graduated from the seminary as the valedictorian of his class. He is now pastoring that church, which is much longer, larger now, and doing his part in fulfilling the Great Commission. Another job I had in Haiti was to be the field treasurer and just fill in the gap till somebody else came. <clears throat> Four years later, somebody else came. <laughs> I learned that doing the job of the field treasurer did not always make people happy with me. Um, you know, no, you can't have money to buy a motorcycle today. <clears throat> Somehow I was later chosen to be the director of the Bethesda Medical Clinic. Again, I was just they needed somebody's presence in there, and I don't know how they decided to send me. But this stretched me way out of my comfort zone. Suddenly, I'm in charge of a staff of 25 Haitians who speak at least three languages. And part of my job was to go to town and buy all the meds for the clinic. I did not have a clinic Creole vocabulary. I worked with children. I knew the Creole to sit down, be quiet, sing. <laughs> I did learn in Creole to say, drop your drawers, but... <clears throat> uh, sorry. God blessed this ministry in spite of me. We would often treat as many as 250 patients a day. 
in our clinic. And the clinic chaplain would have devotions with all the patients before we started our work. That was one of the neat things. You can do that in Haiti. And all the Haitian staff, we would meet together in my office and have devotions before we started working. But it was through the prayers and the witness of some of the staff that led many people to Christ in the clinic. They've even led witch doctors to Christ. Sometimes a family would bring a child to the clinic. Perhaps mom died in childbirth. And, or they just can't feed another body. So they would bring the baby to me and just drop it off at the clinic. And I would take it to a local orphanage where it would have a better chance. <clears throat> it was during this time that a local boy was studying medicine in the Dominican Republic. When he was home on his breaks, I would have him work at the clinic and help him some with the schooling. Today, that little boy, Dr. Rodney, is director of the medical clinic. You never know what you're gonna see in Haiti. One day when I was driving in town, I saw this scene and I had to take a picture. I still don't know if that is going up or coming down. But I do believe that the man at the bottom had the most faith. <clears throat> and I really don't know if I would have had enough faith for that project. When the country was in political and social and economic turmoil, much like today, I took that picture. Um, <clears throat> All of our OMS visitors were sent home and there were only five of us missionaries left on the field. Uh, and I remember it was a Sunday, Jenny had emailed me and asked if everything was okay. She had heard that the rebels took over the Cape Haitian airport. I hadn't heard anything, I was fine. I told her it was a beautiful day, nothing happening here. Bam, that night, nine armed men broke into our duplex where Mary Lou and I were living. And they just proceeded to take out everything they wanted of the houses. And that was the night I learned what it was like to be scared spitless. There is such a thing. You see, some of those guys were high on drugs. Drugs in Haiti were cheaper than food. They allowed us to sit down while they carried out things. Eight of those nine have since passed away. Now that night could have been really, really bad had someone somewhere not been praying for us. And I believe with all of my heart that God woke up some people in the middle of that night and said, pray for those two missionaries. And they were faithful to pray because I'm able to be here today. You see, it really does matter whether or not you pray. I wanna thank you today for your gifts and your prayers over the years of my ministry. You've had an impact for the kingdom of God. And we might see, not see the results here, but when Jesus comes, we'll see. And you will have a part in that because you were faithful to him. A lot of people ask me why I am a missionary. And this verse in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 sums it up for me. Very simple because the love of Christ compels me to do what I do. What is God asking you to do today? Jenny sang the song for us. Is there anything you can do? Can you give so that others can go to the mission field? Is God wanting you to go on a mission trip and help others? We can't all go but we can all pray. It doesn't matter if you're tall or short, young or old, sick or healthy, we can all pray. 
And we want to help you to be able to pray for missionaries. So in your bulletin today is a blue paper that has some guidelines to help you pray for missionaries. Because we believe it does matter that whether or not you pray. And I want to ask you, what is it God is asking you to do? There's something you can do. Please be sensitive to his leading and say, yes, Lord, I will do it. Thank you. Thank you for that message this morning. Why don't we all stand and worship together?
Father, we thank you for your breath that fills our lungs. We thank you for this morning where we could gather together and be in your presence. Father, I pray that as we move into a time of offering, that we would truly allow this to be an act of worship, an act of giving, an act of giving back to you just a portion of what you've poured out upon us. Father, we pray that these gifts would be used to advance your kingdom, to feed missionaries, to feed people that are hungry. Amen. You guys can be seated. If you're in-house, we're going to have ushers pass the plates. You guys can start doing that. And if you're at home, there should be this nice little screen that should be popped up. gives you all the ways you can give from afar. And uh, as Pastor Sam always likes to remind us that if you're just watching us and you're from a different church, we encourage you to support your church. And if you feel so led, you can support us as well. We have just a few announcements to take with us as we prepare to leave today. Uh, keep in mind, October 23rd, next Saturday, is what we're calling Giggles with the Girls uh, for women to come and uh, participate to see a uh, Christian comedian. There'll be snacks, there'll be fellowship. And uh, we're asked to sign up on the Because You Count sheet, or perhaps if you missed that today, you could uh, see Anne at the... Uh, welcome desk. There's a meeting next week uh, for the 30 and 40 age group, anyone who's interested in forming connection groups in that age bracket. That would be next Sunday, October 24th, uh, 1230 p.m., which would be right after this service. Lunch and child care will p be provided, and I think um, it's, it's advertised as pizza with the pastor, so I assume pizza will be the lunch. And Sam reminded me that to sign up for this event, uh, you do it on the website. And uh, we have the annual, fourth annual Trunk or Treat coming up on Sunday, October 31st, 6 to 8 p.m. We're taking candy donations, and I think there's a box at the back entrance of the church for that purpose. Uh, a few volunteers are being asked for to cook the hot dogs and to serve the hot dogs and bottled water that night. See Amy Smith if you feel that you can help with that event. And then, of course, we have Operation Christmas Child coming up, and the boxes are uh, outside in the narthex. And so um, I, don't, I don't see the date when that's ending, but we'll hear about more about that as time goes on. So uh, I think I cover all the announcements. I think so. Okay. Why don't we stand and worship?
So I want to thank everyone who participated in Laity Sunday, the musicians, um, Jenny for singing and playing for us, and of course, Kim's faithful every week. Um, Joetta, thank you for your message, it was awesome. And as we leave, let's think about the fact that we are, in fact, all ministers of the gospel. It's, it's our turn to take the word out there, not just depend on our pastors to do the preaching for us. It's our work, our job. And so we keep that in mind. And from Jenny's song in particular, we need to think about what can I do? Anything I can do for you in return for all that you've done for us. So that's something we all need to think about as we head out into our week. And may God bless you. Um, my own um, benediction, I chose 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus and the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit, be with you now and always. Amen.